to welcome all of you to the seventh and final colloquium in our 2015-16 colloquium series. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank Terry Ponchek, who has headed. who headed the committee this year, who has brought us a series of wonderful and interesting speakers. And with no further ado, I will introduce Terry. Hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Before we start our last colloquium of the year, uh, I would like to take a minute to thank you for being such a great audience for us this year, and also to thank the people who were involved in developing all of the colloquia this year. In particular, I'd like to thank the members of our colloquium group, Jim, Rosemary Dannon, Jim Adler, Bill Clarkson, Dick Heiser, Sandra Zaitso, Richard Goldman, and Marilee Goldman. Thank you all so very, very much for all your guidance and help. I'd also like to introduce Richard Adler, who's going to take over for me and be the new chair next year. So here's Richard. Treat him kindly, please. Um, according to the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. now has more than 57,000 industrial control, control systems connected to the internet, more than any other country in the world, and they're all vulnerable to attack. Two months ago, in March 19, uh, 1916, 2016, seven Iranian computer experts linked to Iran's uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps were indicted by the United States government and charged with cyber attacks on over 48 U.S. banks and on the Bowman Dam in Rye, New York. The uh, attack on the dam failed because the dam was under repair and offline at the time of the attack. But it was aimed at seizing a piece of U.S. infrastructure. Intelligence experts speculate that these cyber attacks were intended as retaliation for what Iran perceived of as the U.S.-led cyber attack in 2010, employing the Stuxnet virus on Iran's main nuclear enrichment plant. So yes, both Stuxnets, which many have linked to the United States, and the bank and dam attacks, which many have linked to Iran, sound like cyber terrorism or cyber attacks to me. It kind of depends on your point of view. Um, but how are, they uh, how are they related to our expert today, our speaker? Kerry Notchenberg is Vice President, Fellow, and Chief Architect of the Office of CTO at Simantac. <laughs> Symantec, I'm having trouble with this. This highlights my level of computer expertise, the fact that I'm having trouble with this. Symantec. Symantec, in addition to being the global, global overall market leader in endpoint security, email security, and data loss prevention for computers, as well as the developer of Norton Security, the world's most popular security content, is the company that first discovered and reported that the Stuxnet virus was specifically designed and aimed at uranium enrichment. Kerry is in charge of all technical strategy for all of their core security technologies and security content. His work in these areas has garnered over 85 U.S. patents. He is the winner of the Wall Street Journal Technology Innovation Award, and because he enjoys helping young students embarking on a career in computer sciences, he also finds time to teach computer science to incoming students as an adjunct professor at UCLA where he is extremely popular. He's also, because he's not busy and accomplished enough already, recently published his first novel, novel a cybersecurity thriller that's called The Florentine Deception, if any of you are looking for summer reading. And he donates all the proceeds to the book, of the book sales to charities supporting underserved students and veterans. Kerry has kindly agreed to come talk to us today about cyber warfare, cyber terrorism, and cybersecurity, a topic that didn't even exist before 1982. 
and yet is considered by our nation's top military and political leaders to be the greatest threat today to our national security interest. Kerry will spend about 60% of his talk explaining what a cyber attack is, how it works, and why our systems are vulnerable, and then he'll move on to specific attacks. I think it's important for us to try to understand this new threat, and Kerry's just the man to explain it to us and answer our questions, assuming that we, if you're anything like me, can figure out how to frame those questions. So please welcome Kerry Notchenberg. All right, so I'm told this is a five hour talk or six hour talk intermission. <laughs> so we'll, uh, I, I have a lot of slides, about 3,000, 4,000 slides. Uh, so, uh, when I was invited to give this talk, I, told, I was told that you were a learned society and you like to learn new things, and I'm a computer science professor, and I figured, how can you understand what a cyber attack is if I don't teach you how a computer works first? <laughs> and I'm serious. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to how computers work, because otherwise you can't understand how a cyber attack works. And uh, so hopefully you'll learn a little bit about computers, you'll learn, learn a little about cyber attacks, and uh, you'll also learn about some of the more recent cyber attacks the impact of those attacks. So without further ado, let's just talk about my book, which is <laughs> very, very uh, you already heard about that. It's a, it's a, Hardy Boys meets War Games. If you remember the mo mo movie War Games, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Everything's being donated to charity. Tell your friends. And without further ado, let's start. Okay. So I have lots of topics. These are all the topics. We're going to go through all of them. As I said, may maybe it'll be six hours. So let's start with how a computer works. So how does a computer work? Well, uh, how many people actually have programmed a computer here? Oh, wow. Holy mackerel. Okay. Maybe I don't need to tell everybody. Wow. So a, a computer is basically a dumb machine that follows instructions without asking questions. We know people like this as well, but the computers, <laughs> computer, computers are, uh, are, are very s simple machines and they can do things like adding and subtracting numbers, dividing two numbers, storing the result somewhere in their memory. They have a memory like we do. They can print something onto the screen. They can input data from the user. They can you know, input a number or a, a string of characters from the user. And software that you use on your computer, software being things like your word processor, your video games, your web browser, uh, these are all just pieces, are millions and millions of instructions that tell the computer how to do simple things. So examples of software, as I said, would be video games, word processors, your banking website, computer viruses are also software, as it turns out. So for example, here's a little program. I'm gonna give you your first computer program if you've never programmed a computer before. This is the simple calculator. And you can see there are six instructions. Each of these instructions it, it tells the computer to do one simple thing. And the computer follows these instructions one at a time. So imagine you are on your computer and you double clicked on your uh, calculator icon. What would happen is the computer will follow these instructions one at a time doing exactly what it's told. It doesn't question the instructions, it does exactly what it's told. So the first line says print, enter your first number. So this tells the computer, print on the screen, enter your first number, let's see. Ah, it worked, what do you know? The next line says get a number from the user. Okay, so the user can type in on the keyboard a number and they type in 17, okay. The next line says print, enter your second number. Well, the computer prints this out on the screen so the user sees it. And then the fourth line says get a second number. And literally the instructions to the computer are even simpler than this. They're very, very simple instructions that we give the computer. And the user types in nine when we get the second number. And then we add the two numbers together and we get uh, 17 plus nine is 26. Hopefully we're right there. And finally we print out the results of the screen and we can see the computer got the right answer. This is a computer program. Now you've seen your first computer program. This is a simplification, but you get the idea. So, of course, real computer instructions are far more complex, and so the same calculator program that I just showed you, if we were to show you in real computer instructions, would look something like this. This is a programming language called C++, and this is what I work in, for instance, in my job, and other, many you know, millions of people work in. And you can see it bears resemblance, right? We say enter your first number, enter your second number, we sum them up, first plus second, and this is, this is a computer program, programming language. This is how we instruct the computer. So now you know how a computer works. We're done with the computer science. Let's move on. All right. 
Now, why are computers insecure? So you might think, you know, I often get asked, why, why are all these computers so insecure? Why can't we just stop these attacks? Why do people keep getting attacked over and over? Computers, we, we, you know, we spend all this money on cybersecurity software, the government spends money and we still get attacked. So why is that? Well, computers are insecure because their software, the instructions, remember, when, I, when we say the word software, video game software, your web browser, Internet Explorer, Firefox, these things, software is just a bunch of instructions. And so software has flaws that are introduced by human beings. And because we're fallible, the software is fallible. Now, flaws arise to two, because of two different problems. The first problem that we have are what we call design problems. We design the software in the inappropriate way and so it is fundamentally vulnerable to attack. Here's an example of a poor design. Here I have a door lock and I didn't think ahead of time, or the designer of this door lock didn't think ahead of time that somebody might be able to insert a credit card between the door jam in order to open the lock. A, a better design would be a door lock with a little metal sheath here that would prevent somebody from, for instance, sl sliding in a, cr a credit card. So if this lock were installed as it is designed right now, it is vulnerable to attack by design. It was designed improperly. Make sense? This is one example of software flaws are like this. Software flaws literally have or design, uh, software is designed in a flawed way that causes it to be attacked. Here's another type of flaw, implementation flaws. Now, in this case, the, the design is sound. We have a good design, but we've implemented the design incorrectly. So, I don't know how many people noticed it, but you see the big hole here that we would pull the, the chain out of, it's on the wrong size. So somebody installed this incorrectly, and this is an implementation flaw. The design of the locking system is great, but somebody turned it around, and so therefore it doesn't work as expected. Software has flaws as well because of design and implementation. And these flaws result in vulnerabilities. So a vulnerability is some flaw in software that can be attacked by an attacker to take control of a computer system. It's that simple. So, software has these flaws because it's extremely complex. So, how many people have heard of Android? Android on your, on your phone, right? Or iPhone, there's a different uh, package there. So, Android has 12 million lines of software logic. 12 million lines of software logic. Okay, so think about how many, how many lines, like the, code, the, the instructions I showed you before. Linux, which I don't know how many people know what Linux is, but Linux is used to run the internet. That's all those websites you talk to when you go to Amazon or Google and so on, those are all running on Linux. Linux has 15 million lines of computer logic instructions. Each of those lines, by the way, could have flaws in them, could have design or implementation vulnerabilities. Windows, that you all use, many of you, has 40 million lines of instructions. <coughs> Think about how many chances there are for flaws, and guess what? Office, you know, Word for Windows, Excel, and so on, has roughly 44 million lines of instructions. So there's a huge amount of complexity in this software, and any one, any one of the flaws in here could be potentially attacked by attackers. And the average software program, and you can do the math in your head, has roughly one to 20 flaws for every 1,000 lines of programming instructions. So think about that. A program with 1,000 lines might have 20 flaws in it, some of which could be attacked by an attacker to break in, just like our lock could be. A soft, software with a, a, thousand, uh, sorry, a million lines might have 20,000 flaws in it that could be attacked. And software with 44 million lines, well, you can imagine it would be even more. A non-negligible fraction of those flaws can be potentially attacked by attackers to hack into the software, to break into the software. Now, each of the software systems, as if this complexity wasn't enough, are actually internetworked because we don't live in isolation. Your computer talks to other computers. And it, when you go to have a corporation, uh, a car manufacturer, their systems talk to other computer systems that talk to other computer systems and so on. And so there's a complex ecosystem as well. So for instance, even if this company were secure and somehow figured out a way to secure all their cyber systems because they actually will combine their networks with some of their suppliers, other, other companies they work with, if the suppliers are vulnerable to attack, they then expose the other uh, company to attack. And so there's a lot of, when I say there's connections here, these companies actually connect their networks together. They connect their computers together. So an attack on one means that another can be attacked as well. So this makes it even more complex. Even if you have good cyber hygiene, just by opening up your network to somebody who prints checks for you or manages your air conditioning system, which is done, by the way, over the internet, that could expose you to attack. And this is between companies. If you look at a typical 
computing system within a single company, it's extremely complex. It requires dozens, hundreds, thousands of computers all working together, talking over networks. So if any of these pieces has a flaw, it potentially exposes the rest of the system to an attack. So there's a huge amount of complexity that is being used to run banks and manufacturing systems and telecom systems and power generation and so on. And this introduces the opportunity for even more flaws because of all of this com additional complexity. It's a system complexity. So just to give you an idea of what real instructions look like for a real program of real, of, you know, real complexity, take a look at this. This is a, a C program. This is a C programming language, one of the programming languages we use. And imagine 44 million lines of this. And you have to stare at this and figure out what it does and where the flaw is. Even programmers who are seasoned programmers have trouble looking at this and finding that there are flaws. But attackers don't necessarily have troubles with this because they'll spend all the time in the world required to find the flaws in the software. So it's a lot of complexity. Now, even when software doesn't have flaws, users do. People are flawed. And so how many times have you seen an email like this in your inbox saying, hey, dear user, our systems have been recently had an outage and we need to verify your information. Please log into our website and re-enter your name, social security number, and address. <laughs> right? So even if that bank, let's say, that is being targeted was totally secure, the attacker has now stolen your credentials. And as you le you'll learn in my fantastic novel, it's easy to forge emails. So you can make any email look like it came from anybody you want. It's actually reasonably easy to do that. And then once you click, guess what happens? You give away your information and somebody in Lithuania is really happy. Actually, Lithuania even exists anymore? <laughs> All right. So. How do cyber attacks work? This is the, the now we're going back to the computer science. So you understand the computers run instructions and, and they, they don't care what the instructions are, they do whatever they're told. So let's talk about some attacks. All cyber attacks attack one of three things. One is confidentiality. Somebody steals information from a bank or from the government, whatever it happens to be. This is about theft of information, a design, a blueprint that might be stolen, credit card numbers. The second is integrity. Cyber attacks have the ability, and we haven't seen it too much, but it happens occasionally, they have the ability to modify data. They can, can compromise the integrity of data. In other words, they can change numbers in the banking database, so instead of having $15,000, you have 15 cents. And so for instance, yes. So imagine an attacker could go and compromise the integrity of the data so that instead of having $745, this person has $99,745. And there I have, oops, and there I have, instead of $35,000, I have 34 cents. So imagine what would happen, what pandemonium would take place if somebody compromised the integrity of a banking database so nobody knew really how much they really had, it all just changed. And that's integrity. So we can, an attacker can attack the integrity of a software system or, or, or its data. And finally, Finally, availability. We can attack, or not we, but attackers can prevent a system from being available. So what they can do is they can basically prevent a system from, you can, so you can't contact it, you can't get money out of your bank account, you can't go to the banking website. The power system doesn't work. The traffic lights don't work. The centrifuges don't work. These are, availab these are availability attacks. So if you have rem trouble remembering confidentiality, integrity, availability, remember CIA. <laughs> It's a little different than our CIA, but CIA. All right, so let's see how hacking attacks actually work. I want you to understand exactly how these things work. So the first example is hacking into banking software. How do hackers break into banking software? You're gonna know exactly how in five minutes. Here we have Sue, hi Sue. Okay, and Sue is logging into her bank account. So here's a banking website. This is the software that's running the banking website. It's a little bit more complex than this, but let's start with this. As you can see, the banking website has instructions. They tell the computer what to do. The first instruction says, wait for a new login attempt. Wait for somebody to connect to me. That's what that means. The second line says, save the user data, whatever data is sent up by the user. They type in their name and password and so on. Save that data on lines in six, seven, and eight, and so on. The next step says verify the credentials, make sure that Sue typed in her proper password before we let her log in. The next step says send a result to the user like Sue's balance, her account balance. And finally we skip to line nine. Line nine says go to back to step one and we do the whole thing again. Simple, this is very simple. This is the way banking software works at a high level. So let's watch Sue. Sue wants to log in. And so first of all, our server is waiting for a new connection attempt. So Sue is uh, trying to connect up with her web browser to 
the website and she connects in, so there we go. And she sends in her username of Sue and her password of YQ127S, thank you Sue. So Sue sends it up and our banking website says, okay, I'm gonna save that data in my memory because computers have memory, just like we do. And we save that line, the username is Sue and the password is YQ127S. Then we verify the logging credentials. So we go look in the database, a database that just holds a lot of data, it's a thing that holds a lot of data. And we look in it and we see, oh, this bank is very popular, it has four users, okay. <laughs> not, not a big bank. Uh, so we see there's four users in the bank and we, for each user we have a password. And so we look and we search through the database and we find out, ah, there's Sue, Sue's in the database, her password is YQ127S, they all match. So we say, ah, that's good. We send the result to the user, which is, hey, Sue, you have $15,300 in your bank account, you should be really happy, why don't you pay some fees? Okay. <laughs> and then we skip to line nine, and then we go back to step one, and back to step one, and now we're waiting for the next user to come in. So we're, everything's working great. So now you know how the bank account works normally on the internet. Let's see what happens when somebody really bad with a hoodie, okay, comes in. <laughs> and breaks into the bank account. So watch, watch, our, watch our friend here. So he's gonna connect to the bank account, to the banking website. So we got the connection. And now this person doesn't just send one line with the username and password, but they send one, two, three, four lines. Not one line of data, which is what the website was expecting. The, the bank was expecting to send a username and a password. But this attacker is sending four lines of data. So next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna save this data on lines six, seven, eight, and so on. Now I want you to watch something. Watch this line right here. This is a computer instruction that's part of the banking software. The banking software, the people who built the bank wrote that software and they put that instruction right there. So the first thing is we save user data on line six. So we take the first line there, which is username gotcha, password gotcha. Huh, that doesn't sound valid, but okay, we'll do it because we're a dumb computer, we do what we're told. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna store the word open, pa open up password file. Huh, password file, that's interesting. We're gonna set, store the words send all passwords back. Huh, okay, well we're, we're told to store that data so we'll store that data. And finally, watch very carefully, we're gonna store the last line, go back to step seven, right over here. Now what happened, that line caused the attacker, or rather the attacker caused that line to overwrite the existing instructions that were part of the banking software. You see what happened there? That line, because the program, the, this is a program, the software instruction says, save all this data on line six, seven, eight, and so on. This line here got stored over the banking software. The attacker has replaced an instruction that the bank put in the program with an instruction that the attacker controls. So watch what happens. We go to the next line, we verify the credentials. We say, okay, is there some user named Gotcha Gotcha? But well, we look for Gotcha, there's no Gotcha. There's Sue and Carrie and A. Bromwich and so on, but no Gotcha. So we send an error message back that says invalid username and password. Hey, we don't know who you are, Gotcha Gotcha. So we send that back to the user and he says, huh, I don't care. We skip to line nine as we did before. And when we do that though, something happens. This line no longer goes back to wait for a new login attempt. It doesn't go back to line one. It now goes back to an attacker controlled instruction because remember the computer does whatever it's told. And in this case, the computer will go back to step seven and run the attacker's line instructions here, which says open up the password file. So we got the password file and then send it back to the attacker. And now the attacker has 100 million different account names and passwords. That's it, <laughs> that's an attack. So now you know how a cyber attack works. All the attackers are doing is getting their instructions to run on the computer rather than the original instructions of the, bad, of the good guys. That's what an attacker is doing. Now, as it turns out, these attacks don't just work on banking websites and other websites. That same attack of getting a computer to run the attacker's instructions works on PCs too and Macs for, for that matter. So imagine you're, again, Sue is really getting into trouble today. Uh, imagine she goes to the DalaiLama.com website, which by the way was attacked by attackers a couple years ago. Uh, if an attacker takes control of 
a computer on the internet, let's say the Dalai Lama website, which is just a computer somewhere in Tibet probably, so, or maybe it's not in Tibet actually, it's probably somewhere else, but there's some, some computer that holds the, the, the website for that uh, website, DalaiLama.com. Imagine an attacker takes control of that. How would an attacker take control of that? Exactly the way I just showed you. They'll introduce their own instructions, they'll take control of that website, they now can change this website. And imagine they take the Dalai Lama website and they modify it, they modify the web page that goes down to your computer, they change the instructions, bless you. Because you know what, a web page that you see on your computer is just a bunch of more computer instructions. That's all it is, it's more computer instructions. So imagine they add a new computer instructions, instruction to this web page that says attack instructions. Replace web browser instructions with malicious instructions. So they add some malicious instructions to the web page. And now, par pardon me Sue, when Sue visits a website and she downloads the Dalai Lama web page, guess what? Her computer is now going to run the attacker instructions and turn red. Well, actually, it won't turn red, but that's how you know it's infected. That's that easy. So literally, by visiting a website, reading a web page, some news on a medical site, your computer can get attacked if an attacker has first compromised that, that website. That's all it takes. You don't have to click on anything. You don't have to do anything at all. Just by visiting a website, your computer can be attacked. And if it weren't, uh, it's, it's actually even easier than that because, for instance, if you receive an email with a document file, a spreadsheet file, you know, an Acrobat reader file, or other files, these can also be used to introduce foreign instructions, malicious instructions on your computer. So literally, just double clicking on a document file can be enough to infect your computer. So if you receive an email from somebody, they say, take a look at this document, and you don't know the person, even if you do know the person, because it could be forged if they really wanted to, you can be attacked. Your computer can be attacked just like the banking website. Okay, so that's the first attack, a hacking attack. The second attack we'll talk about is computer malware. All of these are, by the way, used in these advanced attacks, cyber warfare and so on. So malware is malicious software that performs unauthorized actions on a victim's computer. That's what malware is. If you've heard of computer viruses, that's a form of malware. If you've heard of spyware, so we'll, t we'll talk about these. So spyware, this is a form of malware. What is spyware? Well, this is software, a bunch of instructions written by an attacker that are running on your computer without your knowledge. So it's not, you don't want it to run on your computer, but somehow an attacker has introduced these instructions onto your computer without your knowledge that monitor your browsing habits, your passwords that you type in, your credit card numbers, and then sends the data back to the attacker. That's spyware. A zombie, how many people have had zombies on their computers? Oh, you just don't know it, okay. <laughs> This is also called a bot. So a zombie is a piece of software, it's almost like a puppet. Puppets can be, you know, the strings can be pulled on a puppet. The zombie software just sits on your computer and does nothing. It just waits for its strings to be pulled. And when they, the right time comes, an attacker can pull the strings and cause the zombie software to do something on, on its behalf. Okay, so the software sits there, your computer is taken control of, but nothing happens, just sort of waits until the attacker wants to do something. Adware. How many people have seen strange advertisements popping up on their computer? Well, this is often due to something called adware. And what adware does is it monitors your web browsing habits, not to steal your passwords or to steal your banking account information, but rather to look at what you're surfing for and then give you targeted advertisements. And then guess what? When you click on those advertisements occasionally, you know what happens? The, the bad guy gets your advertising revenue. So every click, 50 cents, 25 cents, they make money. The other thing that adware will do sometimes is it will actually go install itself on your computer and then click on other people's advertisements for you without your knowledge. So it's as if you're clicking the ads, you're then generating money for somebody who's selling those ads on a website because there's a lot of money in selling advertisements. You know, you know I think a mesothelioma ad, uh, if you've heard of the you know, mesothelioma, the disease, if you click on one of those advertisements you see on a web page, that's worth $20 to the advertiser, $25, $30 to the, to the website that hosts that advertisement if you click on that. There's a huge amount of money uh, that's paid. Ransomware. So uh, ransomware is really nasty because what it does is it encrypts your documents, your spreadsheets, your images, your home movies, all the things that are important to you with strong encryption, which is basically an, you know, like an enigma. It's encrypt encrypting all the data. And then they blackmail you for payment to unlock those documents. So if you don't pay them $1,000, you know, your, all your data is gone. And imagine if a medical practice with all electronic medical records got hit and all of their data were encrypted unless they paid. You'd pay. You'd lose your business otherwise. 
And attackers either trick the user into installing this malware. For instance, they might say, hey, here's a free video game. Install this on your computer. But it's really not a free video game. It's really spyware or something. Or what they do is they will silently attack the user's computer like we talked about with the Dalai Lama webpage. So literally, by visiting a web page, one of these four or five things will come down to your computer without your knowledge. You will never see it. You will have no indication that it happened. And your computer will now be running foreign software that is unbeknownst to you. So those are many types of malware. Now, one type of malware we don't see that often anymore, but is really interesting, I think, is the virus, the computer virus. I'll, and I'll show you that in a second, but let me show you quickly ransomware. So what does ransomware look like at a high level? What are the instructions? Well, the ransomware generates a random 30-letter password, maybe. This is a bunch of letters that you'll never remember. And then it searches the computer for the user's photos and encrypts all the photos with a password. So imagine it scrambles all the data using that password so that it can only be retrieved with the password. And then we send the password up to the attacker's computer. So the attacker now has the password that was used to scramble the data. And then we destruct the password on the user's computer so the password is no longer on your computer where all your encrypted documents are. And finally, we alert the user that their files are being held ransom, and we ask them to pay money. That's the way that ransomware works. It's very simple. It locates documents, it encrypts them all, sends the key, the password, up to the attacker, and then you have to pay. And by, well, these guys are really, really bad. Uh, here's a couple examples. This example is what will be showing up, what shows up on your computer screen once this happens. And it says something like, your computer has been locked. And I don't know if you can read the fine print, you probably can't, but it says, child pornography has been found on your computer, and you will be reported to the FBI if you don't go and pay this ransom. And by the way, you won't get back to your, you won't get your files back either. So they really try to convince you, you know, by threatening. It's blackmail. This one here says your personal files are encrypted. If you don't go and, and uh, pay us within 72 hours, all your files will be destroyed. The password will be thrown away. The files will be lost. So there, there's a lot of actual social engineering that goes into designing these messages to convince people to pay. And in fact, there are even chat services. So if you don't know how to pay, they actually have a button that says chat with an expert to help you so we can get your money. Yeah, they're very, they have call centers. They're very, they're very impressive. They have a help desk. Yeah, they're very good. Okay, yeah, right. Okay, so what's a computer virus? Well, this is another type of malware. This is what I started working on in the early 1990s, and I think it's a really, so it's a fascinating type of attack because a computer virus is very much like a human virus, a biological virus. Biological viruses can only survive when they attack a host cell, attack a host cell. And so they actually have to be in a human living or a living being in order to spread. A virus can't spread really without having a host, can't replicate. And computer viruses are very similar. So computer viruses are computer instructions that automatically copy themselves from one computer program to another. So let's see what this looks like. So how does a computer virus come about? They don't just randomly come, come into being. A computer hacker has to create them. And a hacker finds a legitimate software program like a video game. So here's a video game. And the instructions are print, welcome to Pac-Man. So it'll print that out, welcome to Pac-Man on the screen. And then play the Pac-Man theme music. And then display a maze on the screen. You can see it's very simplified, but you get the idea. It's Pac-Man, three instructions, four instructions. What the hacker will do is they're going to take this video game that they know everybody wants to play that video game, at least back in 1980, and they will then insert computer and virus instructions into the program by hand. They'll actually do this by hand, like that. And if you look at the red, the red instructions are viral instructions. And I'll go through them one at a time, don't worry. So the black instructions are the original host program, the program that's legitimate, that does something useful like play Pac-Man or maybe a calculator. The red instructions are instructions that the attacker has added. Now, if you got a computer program on the internet, some software, you would not be able to tell the difference between this and this because you never look at the instructions that make up the software. You just see, yeah, it's software. I'm going to get it on my computer. Okay, so this is the original software instructions. These are the inst original instructions. And these represent, the vi red uh, items represent the viral instructions. So step three, the hacker distributes this tainted software to victims on the internet. So imagine you're on your computer and you download the infected video game. Okay, so it's called an infected video game because it actually has the viral instructions infecting it. So here we go, it's coming down from the internet. Hopefully it's not this slow. There we go. Now we have the video game. We're saying, oh boy, we can play Pac-Man. So we click on the Pac-Man icon because we want to play the Pac-Man game. And what happens? The computer 
runs the instructions. The computer doesn't care what the instructions are. It doesn't have any idea what the instructions mean. It just does what it's told. So here are the instructions for the Pac-Man software, the infected Pac-Man software. Step one, skip to step 100. Okay, the computer follows the instruction. It goes to step 100. Step 100, locate a new software program on disk. Well, guess what? There's our calculator program. So the virus targets and finds another program on the computer. So it locates another software program on the computer. Next step, 101. Insert the words go to step number 100 in the new program that was just discovered. So the virus copies its own instructions into the new program. So notice this program is being modified in a way that is consistent with the original program. Look at this. It had a go to step 100 here. It has a go to step 100 here. The virus is self-replicating. Step 102, append lines 100 through 104. Lines 100, 101, 102, 103, 104 to the end of the new file. So we're going to take all of these instructions and we're going to copy them over here. Watch. So now the virus has copied its instructions over to the new software. Line 103, this is called a payload. A payload is when you do something nasty to the computer. So this virus is going to trigger on January 1st. It says, if it's January 1st, format the hard drive, delete all the data. Let's take out the computer and say, ha ha, to the user. But of course, it's not January 1st. And then line 104 says, go back to step two. Well, go back to step two. Well, that's right up here. That's the first step of the original Pac-Man game. So this goes back up here. <laughs> And this all happened in about 20 milliseconds. You wouldn't have even known it was happening. Not as slow as I'm doing it on the screen here. It would have happened in about 20 milliseconds. This would print out Welcome to Pac-Man. So let's see it. There we go. Welcome to Pac-Man. And we'll play the music. Maybe you can hear it. OK. Maybe you can hear it. And finally, we display a maze on the screen. And you'd be playing Pac-Man. And unbeknownst to you, your calculator had just been infected. And if we look at the calculator, we'd see the viral instructions before and after in the Pac-Man game, in the calculator game. This would go and spread to every file on your computer one at a time. And if you shared a file with a friend, they would get infected and it would spread between their, their files. So this is sort of the, the, one of the original attacks that we saw way back when. Attack number three, the denial of service attack. So what is a denial of service attack? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. Here we have the internet, lots of computers out on the internet. Here we have a bank server. This is the computer that runs the banking software that we looked at earlier. Uh, and a denial of service attack, we call it a DOS attack. DOS or DDOS, distributed denial of service attack, is an attack where a, hack, where a hacker basically brings a website to its knees. It floods it with malicious traffic. Imagine you wanted to go to the bank and there's a line 5,000 people long get, trying to get into the bank. You can't get in until the other 5,000 people go. But by the time you get in line, there's another 5,000 people. You just can never get into the bank. Same thing can happen on the internet. So here's what happens. Normally, internet sites like our banking website are designed to handle thousands of legitimate simultaneous connections per second. So users are connecting over the internet, sending data back and forth, and everything works fine. That, that's the way things normally work. However, what happens with an attack, a DDoS attack, is the attacker causes large numbers of computers to overwhelm the victim, this is the victim, with millions of invalid requests per second. So basically it's a bunch of fraudulent requests that do no good and prevent the legitimate requests from getting in. So how do they do this? Well, before they're going to launch the attack, they infect all these systems, or many of these systems, with thousands of zombies. Remember the zombie software? It's software that does nothing until it's told to do something bad. And so what they do is they would infect all these machines with red. Hopefully you're not colorblind. Uh, they infect all those machines. Over time, it might take months or years to infect those machines so that thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of computers are infected and doing nothing. They have no indications that anything is bad. They have software that's just waiting to be, have the string tugged, and something to do something bad. And then the attacker then sends a kill message to all these machines. Hi, attacker with a big brain. Attacker says, bye bye bank. He sends a message to all these computers in red that basically causes them at the same exact time to send millions and millions or tens of millions of requests all at the same time to the bank. And so the bank then is overwhelmed and it can't accept your request because it's taking a request from the bad guys. So those are that's how cyber attacks work. That's basically, the, all cyber attacks are basically those types of attacks. All right, so 
let's talk about some real cyber attacks that have happened recently. So these are just from 2015, and I have one from 2013, which I think I'll go into detail on. It's actually a lot, lot more interesting. Many of these are cookie cutter. In other words, they're the same types of attacks over and over. I'm not going to go into details on how exactly the attacker got in. I'll tell you the, 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 the result, the ultimate result. So Anthem, Anthem Healthcare, was breached in 2015. Hackers breached the systems of health insurer Anthem, exposing nearly 80 million personal records. So you remember the attack I showed you where they, the attacker went after the banking website and got the password file? That exact attack could be used potentially to expose the records of 80 million people. The attack exposed birthdays, <laughs> dresses, social security numbers, and emails. So now all of these people potentially can have fraud committed against them. There's an ATM breach in 2015. An unknown group has not been attributed yet, infiltrated hundreds uh, of banks in multiple countries, multiple different attacks. How do they get into these banks, by the way? They might send an email to an administrative assistant to the president. The administrative assistant doesn't know cybersecurity, double clicks on the attachment, maybe a document, and then the attacker is inside the network, and then they can spread to different computers and then find the information they need. So hundreds of banks in multiple countries swiping somewhere around one billion, one billion dollars. <laughs> At least 100 banks in 30 countries were targeted, including, bless you, Russia, US, Germany, and uh, China and the U Ukraine. This is all for money, finan financial gain. White House breach, guess what? Our, go our federal government was hacked. Russian hackers accessed the president's schedule and emails, uh, and revealed personnel details, uh, policy debates, uh, and this was not, apparently not classified data. It was an unclassified network, but I'm sure you know, all networks have uh, varying degrees of, of information passed around on them. I'm sure there was some classified information there as well. So you get the idea. It's very easy to compromise these systems. If, if the president's website or, or, uh, or the president of the White House can be attacked, anybody can be attacked. Experian, the credit card, uh, or rather the credit uh, rating agency. So hackers breached the, their database. Remember the database is just basically a storage of all the data, all their information about everybody. Uh, they exposed names, addresses, birth dates, social security numbers of 15 million, specifically T-Mobile customers in this case, who happened to be using Experian for verification of credit before they would give people a, a phone. The Office of Personnel Management, another government of federal attack, the U.S. government agency in charge of background checks was breached, again, using the same approach you just learned about, exposing information on virtually every federal employee since the year 2000, cumulatively, and the attackers obtained names, addresses, health information, just in case they wanted to find out that you have goiter or something, financial history, social security numbers, and more than one million fingerprints. So the, attack, the hackers now have literally biometric fingerprint data on the victims for a million people. Now, I went in a high level about these attacks just to give you a flavor of what's actually happening. These happen every day. They're regularly happening. Tens of millions of accounts stolen on a weekly, monthly basis. But I want to share one interesting story with you to show you how, to what lengths the attackers will go to in order to compromise a victim corporation. Uh, this actually occurred in 2013, so it's a little bit older, but it's just a fascinating, I think, fascinating attack. We call it francophoned. Francophoned. Um, because it happened in France, and there was a phone involved. So you'll see why, francophone. <laughs> okay, now, in order to protect the innocent, we're gonna call the victimized company Escargot International, okay? So we'll just call the victim company Escargot International, um, and you can think of little snails there. All right, so here we have the woman at Escargot International. I'm sure she speaks wonderful French. I don't speak French, so I'm going to butcher everything here. But she's there at Escargot International. And she receives an email from a vice president in the company, from Renee. Oh, sorry, to Renee. She's Renee. Hi, Renee. And basically the, uh, the subject is, hey, purchase order. Please process a purchase order. It says, hey, Renee, please process this purchase order as soon as possible, or we may lose the deal with a customer to competitor. So there's a document that explains the purchase order, how much we should bill the customer, and so on. All the details are in there. And Renee looks at it, and she says, oh, I'll take care of it in an hour. So I'll take care of it a little bit later. But you know what happens? Shortly after Renee receives this email in her inbox, she receives a phone call in perfect French from someone who purports to be the vice president that sent this, e sent this email. And this person was an attacker, as you can tell from the, the hoodie. So this person says, Bonjour, 
This is Pierre from accounting. I'm just calling to follow up on my email that I just sent. Please take care of this ASAP. So the attackers are actually using the phone as well as digitally, digital techniques in order to trick Renee. So Renee, of course, doesn't want to lose her job, so she clicks on the document. And guess what happens when she clicks on this document? Her computer is infected. A computer piece of malware, uh, is a zombie effectively is on her computer. So now, unbeknownst to her, simply by viewing a document, an invoice that looks like an invoice, it looks just like an invoice, her computer is now infected in the same way I showed you. All right. So. The attacker has control over the software on Renee's computer now. So the attacker really can look at every file on Renee's computer. The attacker can look at everything that Renee is doing, every keystroke she types, types everything. The attacker has total control. So the attacker basically connects to Renee's computer and says, oh, look, there's some interesting documents on Renee's computer. These are legitimate documents owned by Escargo International. So the attacker is rifling through the documents of the corporation now. And so the attacker finds a first document called disaster plans, disaster plans. What, happen, what do we do in, in, the, in the event of a disaster? What's the plan? What are the steps that we take if there's a disaster? You know, maybe there's a flood or an earthquake. What do we do? The attacker also finds another document. And of course, these are probably in French. But the other document is called banking document. So, huh. The attacker found a document that includes all the banking details for Escargot International. So the attacker now knows where they do their banking, where their money is, and they also know what the disaster recovery plans are. All because Renee double-clicked on a document. I always tell my father, don't double-click on anything. Okay, so the attacker looks at disaster plans, and he says, oh, what do these disaster plans say? Looks in there, and he finds out that in fact there's an insurance company that uh, you know, is used for disaster recovery, and also, oh, the telecom provider. So of course every company, every major company works with a telecom provider, MCI, AT&T, whatever it happens to be, right? And so the attacker looks at that and says, ah, very interesting, very interesting. The telecom provider is Teleco Franco. I made that up, it's just like Escargo International, but let's, present, let's pr pretend that's a telecom company. And so the attacker, gets on the phone to Teleco Franco. They call up the telephone company. And the attacker says, Hi, this is Suzette. Let's pretend this is a woman here. We can't tell, it's dark. Hi, this is Suzette from Escargot International. We had a broken water line at our main office and we need to evacuate. Can you forward all inbound phone calls to an, our other office? So the attacker calls Teleco Franco, and the Teleco Franco people say, yes, I'll take care of that for you once I verify your account details. Well, guess what? Who has the account details? The attacker, because the attacker has all the disaster recovery plans. So the attacker says, merci, our account number is, and they give the account number. Please forward all calls to this number, and they give a number to forward all the calls to. So now, guess who's going to be receiving every phone call to Escargot? That guy or gal. And of course, the French guy says, I will make the change now at the telecom company. And what will happen is that at Teleco Franco, they're going to put a little number in their switchboard that says, forward all Escargot International calls to that number given by the attacker. Make sense so far? What happens next? Well, the attacker's not done. So the attacker looks at the banking document, looks at the banking document and says, oh, Interesting. This company, Escargot, is doing their banking with Eurobank Limited. And the, con the uh, contact number for Eurobank is this contact number, and our account number is this, contact this uh, account number. So what does the attacker do? They contact Eurobank Limited, also made up. Eurobank Limited, they get a call. The attacker calls Eurobank Limited and says, hey! This is the financial officer, chief financial officer at Escargo International. And Eurobank says, or actually, hold on, and, she, and the, the quote unquote chief financial officer says, I'd like to transfer 500,000 euros from account 909953 dot 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 to the following numbered offshore accounts. That seems sort of fishy, right? The bank says, wait a second, this is fishy. This looks like it's you know, inappropriate. We shouldn't be transferring lots of money from Escargo to offshore accounts. So the banker says, this sounds fishy. I better call Escargo's finance department to determine if this is a scam or not. So they call the finance department, but guess what? 
All of the phone calls are being forwarded to the attacker as opposed to Escargo International. And what does the attacker say? Hello, Escargo International, Chief Financial Officer speaking. How may I help you? And the bank site says, or the bank person says, excuse me, I've received a request to transfer 500,000 euros to an offshore account. Can you confirm that this is legitimate? And of course, what's the attacker going to say? But absolutely, I confirm this is legitimate. Proceed. And what happened? The bank transferred all of the money to offshore accounts that were controlled by the attacker. This is the level <laughs> that the attackers will go to in order to steal money. And this is just one of many examples. This is a pretty entertaining one, but this is just one of many examples. Now, as it turns out, the attackers were not based in France, but in a little country the size of New Jersey in the Middle East called Israel. So the attackers, I don't know if they were Israelis or what, but they were definitely based in Israel. And as if it weren't enough that you know, they were maybe you know, in some you know, room on a bunch of computers, you can imagine them hacking, stooped over their computers. No, 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 we actually tracked them down. They were actually calling from a cellular network, from a truck probably, in motion, while they were conducting the attack. So they were not actually staying still at any period of time, so they couldn't have been apprehended. They were literally driving the streets of Israel while they were conducting these attacks so that if the authorities found them, they wouldn't be in one place. <coughs> Through a cellular network, they were doing it over the air. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. Uh, what, pretty impressive. Makes an makes a interesting story. Okay. Did they catch them? No, I don't think they've ever been caught. They haven't been caught. Yeah, this is a problem because, by the way, they could have taken 10 hops through 10 other computers. They could have compromised one computer at a time and then gone through 10 different hops and tracking them down as being next to impossible. Next to impossible. It's very difficult to track these people down. So what cyber threats does the U.S. face? Well, you can probably guess, but I'll go through the, the big ones. Bank brokerage and financial threats. And by the way, stealing money is the least of your worries. Imagine again what would happen if an attacker very quietly started making changes to bank accounts, maybe a couple dimes or nickels or dollars at a time, something you wouldn't necessarily notice <laughs> over months and months and months, a little bit at a time, and finally after six months they said, guess what, check your account, and everybody's accounts were off. Imagine what that would do. They could do that. That would be difficult, but they could do that. They could also just steal your information and transfer your money. Critical infrastructure threats. Critical infrastructure runs on computers with the same exact software I just showed you. There's no difference. It's still a software instructions. The attacker can still run their own instructions if the software is poorly written. All of the systems that run, the power, water, traffic lights, all can be attacked in this way potentially. Industrial es cyber espionage. This is a big problem. Uh, Foreign governments in many cases or foreign companies are actually trying to break in to US companies and steal intellectual property, formulas for manufacturing, schematics. All of these things are then distributed for to make to improve competitive advantage. Oh my. Attackers can even make phone ring, phones ring, you know, just like in the middle of a talk. Uh, geopolitical defense and cyber espionage. So there's a lot of cyber espionage going, go, uh, going around. Uh, medical threats. I don't know, I think it's, I don't know if it's a rumor or not, but I believe Dick Cheney's pacemaker, you know, all pacemakers actually have a wireless uh, connection so that they can be diagnosed and you can actually uh, tweak the parameters. Uh, and so uh, supposedly Dick Cheney's pacemaker was actually disabled so that the communications couldn't happen because they were worried that somebody would try to kill him. Yeah. No comments. <laughs> and Internet of Things, IoT threats. How many people have heard of Internet of Things? So Internet of Things is not that complicated. All it means is basically everything in the future, light bulbs, refrigerators, toasters, cars, will all have computer chips in them and they will all talk to the Internet. So your refrigerator will maybe eventually order milk for you. I don't know why I really want to do that, but you know, you could do that. And your light bulbs, you'll turn on your light bulbs and have disco lights whenever you want with your iPhone, with your phone, right? So all of these devices are connected to the internet and they all potentially are vulnerable to attack in the same exact way I just showed you. So imagine if all of your lights suddenly started going on, your refrigerator went off, your oven went on in the middle of the day, your heater went on, then your, your air conditioner, all possible in the future. Where are the attacks coming from? Well, at a high level, not to blame anybody, we're seeing them from China. We're seeing them from 
the former Soviet Union, Russia, Ukraine, lots of attacks coming from there. And guess where else we're seeing them from? Lots of people in the United States, not Canada and Mexico. A lot of attacks coming from the United States. So these are the three big culprits for the attacks. And a lot of it, from depending on the region, might be cyber espionage, stealing information. It might be trying to break in and steal trade secrets. Uh, it might be trying to steal um, you know, geopolitical negotiating plans. All of these things are, are stolen. And by the way, you know, are we conducting attacks? I think I might hit that later, but yes. I mean, the United States is definitely conducting attacks. It is very active. Uh, we're at least as active as anybody, any other country that you've heard of. And uh, we're just better at it. Nobody, you know, finds out about it. But, they're, they're, you know, the United States is certainly active. Why can't we stop these attacks? Well, oh my. These attackers are really, they're, they're going today. Okay, so why can't we stop these attacks? Well, current systems are designed poorly, as we said, right? For example, Windows will automatically run any software from any source without question. So if you use a Windows operating system, you know, at home, Windows does not differentiate between software from an untrusted source and a trusted source. You can run any software you want from any source on Windows and it's perfectly happy to follow the instructions one at a time and do what it's told. So that means that basically it's almost like, uh, I don't know, if you left your front door open and you said, hey, anybody come in, if you want to look around and touch my tchotchkes, you know, be my guest, you can do whatever you want, I'm not going to stop you. You want to rifle through my cabinets, you want to take some cereal, be, be my guest. That's what happens. So any software can run on the, on, on the system and basically that software can come from good guys, but it also can come from bad guys as well. So until you change the fundamental, fundamental software here to prevent that and you say only trusted software can run, you're going to have attacks because any software, good and bad, can run on the system. The problem is, you might ask, why doesn't, for instance, Microsoft just change it and say, look, you can't come into my house, the door is locked unless I know you and you're certified and you're trusted instructions. The problem is, is there's probably 100 million different software packages that have been created over the years that still need to run. And if you basically change the model for the operating system for Windows, it will not run all that old software. It'll break everything, and then all kinds of people are going to be mad at you. So Microsoft, for instance, has to way, find a way to iterate and evolve their system so that it doesn't break all of the hundreds of millions of legacy software applications that are running that are needed while still making the system more secure. It's very difficult because if you change the security, everything breaks. It's almost like you install new locks on the door, your, your, your spouse installs new locks on the door, you come home, you try to open the door, the door doesn't open. What, wait, what's going on? I can't get in my house. Well, imagine, you know, you know billions of people with software just doesn't work. So existing systems are designed poorly. Two, the internet is totally open. Anyone can set up a malicious website. It takes about 20 minutes. Very easy to do. Anyone can send a malicious email and you can forge them. You can make it look like it came from your boss. You can make it look like it came from you know, the President of the United States. It's not difficult to do this. No one country controls the internet. The right? internet is open, uh, although some countries try. Uh, and uh, so no one, no one controls the internet, so there's no jurisdiction over things. The internet is a wild, wild west. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. Make my day. Three, third-party security packages are a band-aid. So if you run security software on your computer like Norton Security, <laughs> very effective security software, um, because the underlying systems that are being protected are flawed, like Windows, because the underlying systems that we're protecting are flawed, the best we can do is, pr is put a Band-Aid on these machines. We might be 99% effective, but that means one time out of 100, your computer is going to get attacked. And so basically the idea here is we're trying to plug all the holes in the dam, but there's too many holes. So we can keep you pretty safe, you know, very safe, but not perfectly safe. Because unless you change the underlying system, the Windows system, for instance, that runs all the software, you're always going to be vulnerable. So third-party security packages solve some of the problems, many of the problems, but it's impossible to get all the problems. Because somebody will find some way to sneak in some instructions. And finally, or not finally, four, there's a shortage, shortage of security professionals. It's very difficult to hire talented security professionals. We don't have enough trained professionals in this world. You cannot hire enough people that actually know how to operate security software, know how to remediate threats, know how to investigate threats. It's extremely difficult. It's a skilled job. And by the way, even companies that have, organizations that have trained professionals can't keep up with all the alerts. A big company might get 10,000 alerts a day on their cybersecurity systems. 
10,000. If they're lucky, they have 50 people, 20 people, 100 people monitoring those systems. How many things can you do in a day? And investigating a threat is not easy. You have to go and really dig in and figure out, was this a real threat? Or was it, oh, Joe just decided to produce a video game and play a video game on his computer. There's nothing wrong. So each of these incidents of 10,000 a day, 20,000 a day, has to be investigated. Think about that. It's just impossible to keep up. So there's no way to even keep up with all of the alerts that are happening. And so many companies will just go and do the top 10 that they think are the top 10 and the other 90, you know, 20,000, yeah, they'll get to it tomorrow. And finally, even if you fix the software, people are still vulnerable, right? People can always be tricked. You can always be tricked into divulging your password details, your credit card information, you know, bless you. People can call you and, and trick you into giving your property tax information. Well, that's, that's online, you can find that anyway. It doesn't really, it's not that difficult. So even if you were to fix all the systems, people would still be tricked and they'd still, uh, you know, impact you. But there are bright lights. Uh, how many people have an iPhone here? Oh, wow, look at that. Very, a lot of people. The iPhone, Apple, you got to give them credit, they designed the iPhone from scratch. They designed the operating system, like Windows is an operating system. Okay? They designed the software that runs this device from scratch to be secure. How many people have heard of massive attacks on the iPhone recently? <laughs> no, you haven't because it's not happening. You occasionally have attacks, they occasionally find flaws, they fix them right away, but this is a very secure device. If you want to do your banking, do it on this, not your home computer. This is much more secure than your home computer, as it turns out. Yeah, yeah, much more secure. Than your Mac. Than your Mac. Much more secure than your Mac, than your PC, than everything. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's surprising, but it's true. Much, much safer. All right. Now, you might be asking, what can the government do to help? There's a slide. Okay. <laughs> Hold on, here's the next one. See, see? That's it. <laughs> what can the government do? You want the government to make a regulation and say every, every company has to run security software? Well, I'd like that. <laughs> that would be good for my company. But in fact, you can't prescribe how to deal with these threats because the security landscape is constantly evolving. And if we say you should use today's technology, tomorrow that technology is totally outdated and the attackers have changed two or three different techniques tomorrow. So we have to go and constantly evolve. And so if you legislate these things, it becomes very difficult because if you legislate that they have to do X, the attackers will do something that, that where X can't protect against it because there's always a ways around the software. It's a constant cat and mouse game, spy versus spy. The government can help companies be more visible when they are attacked. They can shame companies into saying, hey, I was attacked, and therefore, you know, I don't want people to know that because I'm going to lose business, so I'm going to try to be more secure. But you can't prescribe how people should secure themselves. There's just no way to do it. And uh, it just creates distrust too, because you know what? All the companies, many of the companies, at least in the United States, are international companies. They work globally. And if the government says, for instance, you have to share data with the government in order to help us identify cyber attacks, then all those other countries are going to say, wait a second, you're sharing data with the government? That must be the NSA, the CIA. We're not going to buy your products anymore because we're worried that you're going to give our information to your government. So it's a very difficult problem. So, Government is, is, it's very difficult for the government to do much here, and uh, there hasn't been much value there. Is our government also conducting cyber attacks? Yes, as I said, they are, and the most notable one that came out was the Stuxnet virus. You know what a virus is. Uh, Stuxnet attacked the centrifuges uh, in the tons. The centrifuges actually, if I don't know if you're familiar, but the centrifuges spin uranium hexafluoride gas. And by spinning it, it's a centrifuge, right? So it actually sends the heavier stuff towards the outside and the lighter stuff towards the middle. It's an enrichment pipeline. And what they did, the United States and Israel, it's believed, worked together in order to cause these centrifuges to either spin too quickly so they'd explode or too slowly so they basically rock like a, like a dreidel or a, a top and eventually, uh, if, you know, when they slow down, they start vibrating and destroy the, the uh, ac axle of uh, rotation, axis of rotation. So this is actually apparently very successful. It killed about 1,000 of the 9,000 centrifuges at Natanz. Uh, it was entirely software-based. It was a software attack on a hardware system. It was introduced via the techniques I showed you. And uh, so we're actively involved in this. And this is the one we know about, but lots of them are almost certainly happening that we don't know about. Okay, so let me conclude and I'll take questions. 
So cybersecurity systems have inherent security vulnerabilities, or rather cyber systems have inherent security vulnerabilities that arise from both human flaws, because we're flawed, we can give out information we shouldn't, and technological flaws. Technological flaws can be design-based, the design is bad, or implementation-based. The design is great, but we made a flaw when we, we installed this, the system, we wrote the instructions. These vulnerabilities enable attackers to compromise the confidentiality, integrity, or availability, CIA, of systems and data. The attacks can have a huge impact on their victims from theft to physical destruction. Um, this is actually a reference back in 1982 to a this is supposed, it's not 100%, it's documented, but it's not 100% uh, substantiated. The CIA actually caused a Ukrainian, you know, Soviet pipeline to explode by introducing a booby trap into Canadian pipeline software that was stolen by Russian spies. Uh -huh. so, so, yes. The United States caught wind of the fact that Russians were trying to steal pipeline control software from a Canadian company. They went and worked with a Canadian software company to introduce a pressure uh, basically to increase the pressure so high that the pipeline would explode a little bit after it was deployed and they let the Russians steal the software. They then used it on the Ukrainian pipeline. Boom! Okay. Uh, so it can be physical destruction, theft, and finally there's no silver bullet solution. So the next time you say, well why can't things be just be secure? Well, if everybody were to go and build a new iPhone from scratch and we didn't have to worry about all the legacy software that's running on billions of computers, you could do that. But unfortunately, and by the way, it would never be perfectly secure. There's no way to make a perfectly secure system. But it, would be much, it could be much more secure. And maybe in 10 or 20 years it'll get better. It'll get not perfect, but better. But right now, there's no silver bullet solution. Okay. I'll take questions now. Everybody, everybody, can I, can I please remind you that we want to, after you ask your question, which should be a question, not a comment, um, to hand the mic back to the aisle rather than to your friend sitting next to you so that we can do this in a fair way. Here we Two quick questions. Yes. How do the, the when the money is transferred through r ransom, it must be transferred somewhere. That don't they can't they trace that? And oh. the second question is, uh, whose side were you on between the uh, Apple trying to divulge or the government trying to make Apple divulge their uh, phone secret? Oh, I, okay. That's, so let's answer the first question first and the second question second. Okay. So the first question was. Ransomware, right? They're, they're, they're encrypting your files and they're making you send them money. Can't you trace where the money is going to? And effectively what the, the attackers are doing is they're using untraceable sources of currency. How many people have heard of Bitcoin? Okay, so Bitcoin is an electronic currency that is maintained, it is no, not officially maintained by any government, but there's an exchange rate and you can literally plop down $100 and buy, or $500 and buy a Bitcoin. And it's anonymous. And then you can go and, and plop down a Bitcoin and get $500. And so what these people do often is they will literally go and they will go and say, you need to buy some Bitcoins. Here's instructions on how to do that. Give me the Bitcoins and I'll give you your, pa your password for your files. They'll then use that in order to purchase uh, whatever they want. They can change it in for money. They'll also use things like gift cards from major uh, manufacturers. And they'll set up a bank account, purchase some stuff, send it to a drop address you know, somewhere in the middle of the desert, pick up the box and they're gone. So there's many ways of doing this. Okay. With respect to the second question was, what do I feel about uh, Apple? Should they have decrypted the phone? Uh, that is a very, very charged question. There's, there's arguments on both sides and I would rather not answer that in, in public, but we could have a discussion later about that. Yeah. Hello. Um, <clears throat> You know, with this scenario, it's rather depressing. Have you any suggestions to make it more positive? How do we protect ourselves? When it's your turn. How do we protect? Oh, how do you protect yourself? Okay. So there's there's two two points, right? It's very depressing. Is there anything we can do? So I think that the march towards more secure systems is like the march towards more safe drinking water. As countries, for instance, get more advanced, they go and purify their drinking water, they build purification systems, you don't have to go and worry about getting waterborne diseases. And we, as a world, are evolving towards more secure systems slowly and in fits and starts. And again, the iPhone is an example where we're getting closer. So I think actually in 10, 20 years, it's going to be a lot better. Not perfect, but a lot better, believe it or not. How do we protect ourselves now? Okay, how do you protect yourself now? 
Turn off your computer. <laughs> okay. Well, again, I told you, use your iPhone, use your Android phone. Android is also reasonably safe in order to do your banking and so on. Never do banking from a foreign computer that you're not, it's not your computer. That friend, don't never do it from a friend's computer. Never type in your passwords on a friend's computer. Uh, you know, uh, uh, what I would, I mean, if, you are, if you're really nervous, I would say get two computers. Use one for having fun on the internet and one for doing your banking. Or you can do what's called using a virtual machine. There's a way to do this on a single computer so that you don't expose your banking details to the wild west of the internet. But it's difficult. It's not easy today. Um, Mac is a little bit, not necessarily more secure than a PC, but it's attacked less because there's fewer people that have them. There's less money to be made. So you're probably more secure on a Macintosh than a PC and much more secure on an iPhone. Uh, yeah, who's next? Stand up now. Please. Oh, hi. Um, from what you said about how the attacks happen, a secure, highly evolved password seems pretty irrelevant. Because if they just download your password, what is the function of creating these very complicated passwords? Okay. So the question was, why bother having a really complicated password if they can just download your passwords? I cheated a little bit. Most websites today will encrypt the passwords in such a way that they cannot be figured out easily if they're well-designed websites. So the attacker is probably not going to get your password on a good, well-designed website, like a banking website, but they could get your address details. They might get your social security number. They could get other things. So. I cheated a little bit just to show you how this might work. But passwords are generally encrypted, but not always. There have been attacks recently where the website, where the, where the business did not encrypt the passwords properly, and they were actually able to be hacked by the attacker, and they were all posted. Okay? Uh, but passwords are broken. Passwords are horrible, and, and there, we will eventually find a, other additional me or mechanisms to deal with this. I don't know, again, on your iPhone, you can sometimes use your thumbprint to log into a, your bank account now. That's much better. Because I don't want to, you have to remember 500 passwords, it's just a real problem, and then banks may make you change them, and so on. So it's, it's really problematic right now. Passwords are horrible. They're going to they're gonna go away eventually, once we find a better way. Uh, who has a microphone? Yes. You want so, yes, when self-driving cars arrive, how vulnerable will they be? Uh, so well, the question is, when, when self-driving cars arrive, how vulnerable will they be? Um, I can tell you that we at my company have done vulnerability penetration testing on cars, today's cars, and they are vulnerable to attack many of them. I don't know about all of them because we've only tested some cars, but they can be hacked into. Uh, do I think cars are being hacked into right now? Maybe by government agencies dealing with the worst of the worst people in the world, but probably not happening too often today. However. These self-driving cars will be 100% connected to the internet over wireless networks like LTE, you know, those wireless networks. Um, if they are not properly designed, they can be hacked just like that website I showed you, the bank, or just like your computer. It all depends on the implementation. In other words, it depends on how they design the system and how they implement the system for each car. Uh, but it would not surprise me at some point to see some car going off a cliff because, some, because somebody doctors the software. It could happen. And it would be interesting to see who is liable for that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, uh, what about public Wi Fi? First question. The second question is how can you identify a safe uh, website if you're shopping? Okay, so first question was what about public Wi Fi? If you're at the airport and you're using a public Wi Fi network, uh, there is a chance that you can get hacked. You know, in other words, uh, people can see your computer. If your computer is not properly secured with a great security product like Norton Security, I'm sorry, then, then uh, what can happen is the attacker can actually connect to your computer and potentially install malicious software. They may also be able to view, review some of your transactions, and they can also do what's called get to be a man in the middle, effectively have somebody that stays, stays in the middle when you have a cur as a courier, when you're going to a transaction, they basically get the data and then forward it on and pretend to be you. And so that can all happen if you're on a public Wi-Fi network. I would recommend if you're really worried about that, um, uh, it, it probably doesn't happen that often, but it can happen. Use what's called a VPN, a virtual private network, which is, so, which is software, you can, a service you can install on your computer that will take an encrypted tunnel over the public network that the bad guys can't see back to a safe place that then every, all your transactions go from there. The VPC, uh, VPN. VPN. What was the second question? How do you identify a safe shopping website? 
look, it's very difficult for most people to do. If you really want to do it, you can go to uh, a site like Alexa.com, which actually has website rankings. They tell you how how highly ranked a website is in, in the uh, in the world, and if it's a popular site and it's been around for a while, it's probably more likely to be safe because it would have been taken down. And the other the other thing you can do for is look, do is look for a trusted seal, for instance, a Norton seal or another trusted seal. <laughs> Norton, okay. Um, uh, to you know, protect the site, but there's there are ways of forging those things potentially. So I would stay with established sites and yeah, be safe. Yeah. Okay, you've Sorry. said you've Sorry. said that it's very difficult to identify the source of an attack. Yeah. So uh, you haven't come out clearly to say we shouldn't retaliate, but you have said we're probably doing offensive operations. How do we know who to attack, and how do we avoid that getting hijacked politically? Okay, so the, the question was, it's very di is it, isn't it very difficult, you said, to attrib attribute an attack? And if, if so, if we're doing offensive operations, how do we know we're getting the right people? Okay. To my knowledge, the offensive operations we're doing are not, are not in retribution for any particular attack. They are cyber espionage. Oh. For us to go and understand what is being talked about in the halls of power around the world, for instance. So we are not fighting back and I've never I don't know of any well I don't know of any US based cyber attack where there's been a response tit for tat because of an attack that we faced great thank yeah, you you're welcome yeah. on a more personal level yes <laughs> A lot of us use LinkedIn, and I heard yesterday that the LinkedIn system had been hacked about two and a half years ago, and that they got all of the passwords, yep. and that those were sold in the last couple of weeks on the open market. Um, for those of us who do use LinkedIn, I assume that if we still have a two and a half year old password, we need to change it. Correct. If we have a newer password, do we need to change it? No. If you have a new password, there would be no, no worries. Because and then just one real quick UCLA story. Oh. In 1972, a very dear f boo. Okay. Ooh, there's a lot of hatred here. No, well, okay. <laughs> right. Hello. I'm sorry. Hello. I'm curious about one thing. Yes. We hear about 80 million uh, Computers have been hacked. We hear these figures, but we never hear the, what the cost is. I mean, and I'm just curious as to why that is. Okay. They can say how many were attacked, but they can't. I mean, you can't do it with an individual, but a hospital, a medical facilities across the country, and stuff like that. Right, okay, so I think you're referring to something slightly different, which is, for instance, 80 million credit card numbers or accounts were compromised, for instance, right? Uh, there are probably more than, well, 80 million computers compromised a year might be correct, too. I mean, there's a lot of computers that are attacked. We get billions of attacks we block every year, so there's a lot of computers that are getting hit. It's very, very difficult to estimate the cost because companies don't always report the fact they've been attacked. They don't report how much it costs to clean up. There is cost due to brand damage where people will stop banking with a particular bank or using a particular service because they've been attacked. And so it's very difficult to estimate the total cost of brand damage, wasted time. You know, How do you estimate a secretary who literally can't use his or her computer because it's been taken offline by the IT department to resolve an attack, an infection? And these attacks happen every day, like hundreds of th or thousands of times a day, low-level attacks on, on networks. So the estimates I've seen as high as $1 trillion of cumulative stolen data and, and cost. I've seen estimates in the $20 billion range a year. Uh, it's very difficult to say, and nobody, and everybody who says it is challenged by five other people because, <laughs> you know, it's very difficult to really figure it out. Yeah. Uh, um, here we go. Hi. Hi. Th thanks for your presentation. And uh, there's a company that advertises on cable constantly. They give you a free shredder when you sign up, and monthly uh, they will monitor for a fee and let you know if somebody's trying to hack you or they do something. I wonder if you felt that's worthwhile or 
how you felt about that. Okay, it, w it would depend. So the question was, uh, there are companies that basically uh, will monitor, were you talking about monitoring your credit, right? your credit, for instance, or monitoring your computer, or monitoring what? I don't know if anything's going on with any of your bank accounts. Oh, bank accounts, okay. So there are companies that do monitor bank accounts. Uh, for instance, they will monitor whether somebody's opening up a new credit card in your name, or a new bank account in your name, or taking a mortgage in your name. Uh, there is value in those types of systems. They're offered by the major uh, credit rating agencies like Experian, TransUnion, and so on, and also by third parties. And it depends on the service, but some of those services are useful. Although, really, if you're really worried, you can just call those companies and say, I want to put a hold on my credit, and then no new credit cards will be able to be opened without your permission. So you can just do this manually. In many cases, most people just don't take the time, but you don't have to use a service, although services make it much easier. And, and it depends on the service. Some of them are useful and some of them are not. Can't comment without knowing. Yeah. Um, yes, I heard that um, hit this thing with Hillary her, and her server. There was a hacker in Romania that hacked it or somewhere, and that's how this thing um, came out. And uh, can you comment on the truth of this and also on this situation in general her, with her server? This is very charged. <laughs> so. Um, I do not know any of the details of the hacking attack on Hillary's server. What we do know is that she had an external server. So she set up a, well, server is a computer. She set up her own computer and she put her own email system on it. So every time she received email, it was being saved on that computer. And every time she sent email, it was being saved on that computer before being forwarded out. So every email that was being sent potentially was on that computer. And if that computer were not properly secured, by a security professional who really knows their stuff, and it were discovered by an attacker, um, then it almost certainly could have and would have been compromised, although I don't know the details. Frankly, I haven't looked into it enough to be able to comment. What I can tell you is that the average computer, if you stick it on the internet, you literally connect it to the internet, in about 15 minutes, it'll be attacked. Yeah. By somebody. Now, I'm not saying it's all you know, hackers that are trying to break in and do nation state attacks, but somebody's going to find that computer in 15 or 20 minutes, and it could be multiple people over the course of a day. So the computer can easily be identified. They can break in if it's not properly secured. They can see what all the email said if it's not properly secured, and you can figure out what happens from there. Yes? On a personal level, is it better to turn off the computer completely rather than let it sleep? Oh, I, I, there's no difference. I would say when it's asleep, it's asleep. It's not going to be responding to the internet. It's not going to run any software. Oh, okay. It's perfectly fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, unless it gets up to go to the bathroom. Yes. That's it. <laughs> if somebody hacks into your bank account, yes. who's responsible? The bank or the attack per, uh, attacked account? Financially responsible. Oh, that, you know, that's a good question, and I've discussed this with people. I don't remember. The, there's, there's specific, specific details. It depends whether, for instance, your computer is attacked and, you're, and you are negligible, or the bank was negligible. Uh, oftentimes, bank will make, banks will make you whole even if it's your fault, uh, but it depends, and I don't know the law there, and I don't want to comment because I, I would probably get it wrong. But there is some, yeah. I'm sorry. There we go. There we go. You have to get the, the magic microphone to ask the question. So you're recording. I, you said that the iPhone, because it was uh, uh, programmed from the ground up. What? Yes. You said that the iPhone, because it was pro, uh, programmed from the ground up, is more secure than other devices. Is that the same? Th is the same thing true of the iPad? Okay, so the question was, the iPhone I said was more secure than other devices because it was designed from the ground up to be secure. It's not perfectly secure, but it's more secure. Is the iPad also as secure? And the answer is yes, it's the same software. So I would feel very comfortable on a, a factory iPad or factory iPhone that hasn't been tampered with in some way, uh, doing things like doing my banking. It's much, much more secure. Rather than any personal computer. That's right. When you when you save your uh, data onto an external hard disk, uh, are you saving the uh, virus or whatever has been done to your computer? Oh, so the question is if you back up your computer, right? Yes. And you're backing up everything on your computer, and the virus or malware is on your spyware is on your computer, then yes, you will back up the virus too. And make sure that you keep a good copy of it. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. 
Yes. Uh, could you tell us about cloud? When you save something to cloud, what happens? Is that secure or insecure? You know, okay, good like, question. Like you save your passwords and your bank account and it says save in it the into cloud. cloud. Right. Very good question. Okay, so what does a cloud mean? Cloud is a, is a topic that means a lot of things, or may, actually very little to lots of people. So the cloud basically just means a bunch of computers that a company like Amazon has purchased and they operate those computers for you and they will store your data for you so you don't have to worry about storing it yourself and they will store your passwords for you so you don't have to worry about keeping them yourself and they will store your music files for you instead of you keeping them yourself. So basically it's a service where they're basically, it's almost like imagine you took your photos and you said, I, look, I don't want to keep my photos in my house, the house could burn down, I'm going to give all my photos to the service, they'll keep it in a bank vault for me. Okay. So, is that safer? It depends whether the service that's holding your photos or your passwords is designed to be secure or whether the service that's holding it is in a, in a wooden shack and people are smoking and throwing the, you know, the thatches everywhere, right? Yeah. Every, so the cloud doesn't mean anything necessarily. It means that there are computers that somebody else is operating and that those people that are operating those computers could be more secure or less secure than do, you're doing it yourself. That's all it means. Yeah. Uh, many of us uh, save our passwords on our computers or our iPhones and I realize that we're all susceptible there. But what about saving passwords on your iPhones? Um, I don't know enough about the mechanism. So the question was, is it safe to save your password on your iPhone or, computer. or your computer? Uh, it depends on the software that's used to save your password because again, it could be designed in such a way that it can be attacked trivially. It may, and by the, remember, when you save your, you have a single password, you log in on your computer and then you use that to get all your passwords, right? That's what you're talking about. No, 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 I'm talking about with each individual site, it will save your password. Oh, I see. Or yeah, that's generally speaking, not the safest thing to do. But on an iPhone? On an iPhone, I don't know the design of that. I would guess it's probably safe, but I don't know. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, I would like to know your feelings about Ted Koppel's recent book on the national grids and the terror threat from attacking all of the American grids. Okay, so the question was, what, what, what is my opinion about the, the risk uh, to the electrical grids of being attacked? And I didn't read the book. Are you talking about physical attacks or virtual attacks? Okay. So, a power grid is, frank, frankly, fundamentally run by computer systems running computer software. The same computer systems that you use at home and that Amazon uses and Google and Symantec and Apple and everybody else, those systems are used to run the power grid. And Power Grid, they also employ people, and those people check their email occasionally. And if they check their email and they double click on a document that says, hey, there's a problem with the power, read the document, and they double click on it, the attacker can now get into the Power Grid network. And the attacker can spread from machine to machine, and they could take out part of a Power Grid. So the answer is, they're computer systems, they're vulnerable to attack, they're not running iPhone software. <laughs> they can be attacked. Um, and uh, so an attacker could take out an individual power grid one at a time. An attacker that took the time could break into many power grids if they took the time to do it over time and hid successfully and then boom, all at once they could go and take everything down if they wanted to. All of this is possible. Is it plausible? Uh, a nation state that would try to do this to us would be discovered. We'd be able to figure that out eventually. Uh, the NSA records a lot of stuff. <laughs> and we could probably see where those connections, you know, in other words, it would be difficult to attribute it, but for something that big, we'd probably figure out how to do it. And uh, I don't think a nation state would do it because it would invite such retribution if it were discovered. But a terrorist uh, organization that had nothing to fear could do that if they had the skills. And yes, they could take out large parts of the power grid, I think. But it would take, it would take doing. It's not going to be easy. Yeah. Uh, two questions relating to credit cards. One is there seems to be a movement afoot to have you use your phone to pay instead of a physical credit card. Right. Is that safer or less safe than using a physical credit card? Second thing is there the new cards with chips on them. We've seen things that say that people can buy, you buy a device on Amazon that can get your credit card information off of them. Is there are these supposedly like wallets and things protect those cards? Are those actually of any value? 
Oh, I see. Okay, so, so the first question is, are paying with a phone, like an, uh, you know, an iPhone payment system or an Android payment system, is that more secure than simply using a credit card? And the answer is yes. Those systems are designed to be much more secure. All of the data, all the transactions is encrypted from end to end. It cannot be intercepted by somebody. You know, by the way, you're, um, the swiping machine that you use, that machine, uh, or the machine that it connects to, which holds all the details, does the transactions with the credit card companies. That's running Windows or Linux, one of these operating systems that's vulnerable, and the attackers can get on that and they can watch the transactions potentially. So these encrypted transactions that are going over your iPhone are actually much safer because they're never going to go in the clear over any system where an attacker who had presence could steal them. The second question about things you put in your wall to protect your credit card, like the like tinfoil you put in your head, that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, if you have a what's called an RFID chip in your card, it can be activated at close range by somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, they do have shields for that. Uh, but you know, the, the, typically the chip credit cards you see now are, are not, I don't think they're vulnerable to that. They have to really be in contact with the, uh, they have to be inserted, is my understanding. I could be wrong. All right, who's the microphone? Professor. Prof oh! <laughs> Nobody Thank you me. so much for your presentation, and I'm very impressed with you. I wonder if you would come to my house and secure my systems. <laughs> <laughs> That's not actually the question. But hold on, I got, I got a comment on that. My, my mother told me I had to wear a nice shirt to this talk, otherwise I'd wear my shirt that says, no, I will not fix your computer. <laughs> I, I, I got that. Yeah, what, what's your question? Okay, the actual question is, uh, let's assume, uh, well, we know that the hackers come in and they change the operating system to their advantage. Right. Well, okay, they, they so introduce software into the operating system. Right. Yeah. Why can't there be another copy of the software system encrypted so that the com your computer could test that, see whether or not your own operating system has been monkeyed with constantly and, and uh, prevent uh, attacks? That's, very, that's a very technical question. So I don't know, do people hear the question? Yes. The qu okay, so the, you know, the question is, can we keep a encrypted copy of all of the files on your computer so we can see if they've been monkeying with your files. And if they have monkeyed with your files, we can detect the tampering. Okay, two things. First of all, most attacks that we see do not tamper with the existing files. They add new instructions. They add new instructions. Some of the attacks, like the bank attack which I showed you, does introduce new instructions. It actually modifies the application, but it modifies it in memory, not on the hard disk. So it's, it's, it's in the computer's RAM, it's called the RAM, and it's more difficult to check that. So you wouldn't be able to do a tamper check on that, unfortunately. So, uh, however, modern operating systems do have, like Windows and Mac, do actually have little stamps of authenticity on every file, and you can actually check if a file has been tampered with. You can actually check cryptographically using mathematics to see whether the file has been modified. The problem is if you were to do that on every file you run, it would slow down your computer to such a crawl you wouldn't use it, so it's disabled by default. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Th I think, oh, well, t two more questions and then we'll be done. So make them good. Will you address an email to a dot .mil extension? Does that introduce some higher level of security? How do they protect the Okay, well there's two, two questions there. When you address an email, you're sending an email to somebody at us.mil or something, or US government.mil. There's no higher security there necessarily. You're sending an email to somebody. It's like an email address like, uh, you know, carry at email.com or something, right? That is just like an address like your home address. It's just a number, it's like a number basically. It tells you where to deliver the thing to. When you say, um, you know, joint chief of staff at government.mil, that's just an address of somebody. There's no security in that inherent to it. It's just deliver it here to Virginia rather than here to Southern California. So there's no more inherent security. However, I would guess that most military email systems have a shield around them, if you will, that will make them a little bit more secure. They're probably more up to date in their security because they're worried about attacks. So they're probably protecting their email systems more. That help? Oh. Please stand. You, lady. Um, stand up. Please. I'm a genius. Am I in the general? Yes, please stand up so we can hear you. In this age of children who are geniuses with computers and everything, how much of the vulnerability is coming through them? Especially if you've got a whole network and computers are connected. How do they know not to click on something? They, they're curious and they go on to all kinds of sites. 
Okay, so in case you couldn't hear, the question was, you know, we have all these kids and they're all connected on the internet, and what if they do something bad? You know, can't they introduce all kinds of risks into the home? And the answer is absolutely. Kids want to download video games to their computer. They want a free copy of a video game that they think they can get for free, but it's not really free, and so they get it off of the dark web or some other site, right, that, where that's bad, uh, and it's actually a doctored version, like that virus infected version I showed you, and they infect the home network. So absolutely, they are, you know, they can introduce problems. If you want to keep your kids safe, it's easier if you put them on an iPad. That's going to be a little bit safer than if you put them on. Yeah, yeah. It's, now they can still go to a bad website and they can still type in their home address and their name and the social security number if they know it. But at least they can introduce bad software to that device and you know impact your network. Uh, so finally, should they be taught in school? You should. T we should teach cyber hygiene in school. In other words, how to be more hygienic on the internet. But frankly, that's not going to solve all the problem because people are fallible. They can be tricked. Okay. Thank you very much, Carrie.